It's good to be back. Uh, Jim, thanks for having me back. And for all the invisible hands that have put this uh, conference together, thank them as well. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to uh, briefly touch on four areas this morning and then hopefully get into some uh, good dialogue back and forth. Uh, just coming back from the West Coast and the uh, historic au AUKUS agreement that was signed by the three heads of state, um, probably uh, the most significant multilateral defense agreement in a generation. That puts us on quite a path for the next 20, 30, 40 years with uh, two key allies. Um, PB24, so budget rollout was Monday. I'll talk a little bit about PB24, and what I'd like to do is just give a little bit of uh, background on really what drove the investments that, were, that, that we made and how uh, we're trying to draw that consistency across uh, the next couple of three FIDIPs so that we end up in the late 2040s with a hybrid fleet that we envision in the air uh, would be 60% unmanned and 40% manned and on the sea 40% uh, 40 um, unmanned and 60% manned. Uh, so uh, we did very, the Navy did very well in the budget this year in terms of inside the Pentagon competing for money uh, across a number of areas. And so um, in our accounts from personnel to procurement uh, to operations and maintenance to R&D, we've seen increases anywhere from two and a half to six and a half percent. Um, for our, uh, uh, notably I think, uh, for shipbuilding, which is always a high interest area, uh, nearly $33 billion, which is the largest shipbuilding budget or proposed budget ever. Uh, in aircraft procurement, we dropped just slightly uh, to uh, 17.3 billion from 19, uh, so about an 8% drop, I think. Uh, but we're still procuring some 15 uh, F-35s. Um, installations, where we're putting some focus right now, uh, where we have taken a dip in the past over a long period of time and have not invested in bases and places as significantly as we think we should have. We are trying to get back on step to maintain some level funding there with an increase in installation funding of uh, nearly 20%. So, taking a look at uh, the friction between near-term readiness and being able to fight tonight and the pressure that we have to be able to feel the force that can prevail, and I believe would prevail if we did have to fight tonight. Balancing that against uh, long-term competition and the investments we need to make over the long term. So uh, in my navigation plan, I talk about six attributes. And those attributes not only influence how we think about prioritizing the investments that we make today, but also as we take a look at the long term and the transitions that we have to make to maintain that kind of consistency because we think that these attributes, which include distance, so think long range fires, uh, deception, counter C5 ISRT, the ability to maneuver the force, defense, new investments that we're making in high power microwave and directed energy as an example, delivery, investments we're making in uh, resupply. So think our new uh, John uh, Lewis Euler class, which we have, we have one of those uh, in this budget, as well as taking a look at unmanned possibilities uh, with respect to combat logistics. Um, and then uh, distribution. So coming at any potential adversary across many vectors, both in the virtual and the physical, from seabed to space. Heavy, heavily re leveraging everything that General Salzman talked about, as well as uh, everything that um, Cyber Command uh, brings to bear. And then lastly, decision advantage. And so that's putting us in a position, we think, uh, to not only decide, but act faster than any adversary. So central to that effort, of course, is the investments we're making in Project Overmatch, which we believe is going, to, is going to deliver not only the Navy's next generation operational architecture, we believe that that will be the bedrock of the joint tactical network of the future that allows us to take any data and to push it over any network in a software-defined environment where the software decides what the prioritized information is and how that data is going to flow to the endpoint, whether that's a decision maker or whether that's a weapon system. As you're probably aware, uh, as many of you are aware, right now we have scaled uh, overmatch to a carrier strike group that's operating off the coast of California now. Um, and then we're looking to scale that fleet-wide after that 
uh, and to scale even further across the Navy. If I look at the Navy's progress with respect to funding uh, over the last three budget cycles, if I take a look at PB21 to PB24, um, actually four budget cycles, um, we have seen a 37% increase, some $55 billion across that period of time. Much of that has been from the Congress. All of it is appreciated. But um, that kind of substantial growth is not going to last. The Navy has found $207 billion in savings ourselves um, since over the past uh, decade. In this decade, out running through the FIDUP, we've identified more than $75 billion worth of savings. That kind of work must continue. I think uh, 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 Senator Ernst this morning talked about um, a DOD that needs to be able to deliver smarter, faster, um, and there was one other adjective that lethal. you used. Lethal, 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 lethal. I'm on board. Um, but we have work to do ourselves to find more efficiencies and to take that money and to invest it in those areas that we need most. If you take a look at that $55 billion and you think about that 37% increase, uh, what probably ought to come to your mind is that, well, I'm not seeing the size of the Navy grow. That's very true. So we've said up front that we're not going to have a force that we can't sustain and we are not going to field a hollow force. And so our priorities remain readiness, modernization of the current force, 70% of which we'll have in a decade. So it's got to be able to, it's got to be able to keep pace or outpace the threat. And then capacity. Numbers matter. They absolutely matter, particularly if we're going to fight in a distributed way. But again, I go back to the tension uh, between having a force that's ready to fight tonight and, uh, and, and a force that needs to be competitive for the future. We want to make sure that we can prevail. So, kind of laying out where we are uh, with the budget, the investments that we've made, our thinking with respect to how that'll carry us forward. We're doing a lot of work. If I could uh, talk about the, the third area real quick, uh, which is um, driving adaptability and then affecting change. And in some cases, you can go right to uh, affecting change very quickly. Uh, and affecting change would be taking a look at the way you're doing things and taking a look at new ways to do them. I think the Project Overmatch is an example of that, that accelerates that kind of uh, that, that kind of change. I think that most of what we do, though, um, is we've become more adaptive, right? You see us leveraging unmanned in the Middle East. You see us learning and leveraging uh, AI in the Middle East, not only in terms of commanding and controlling unmanned platforms. We'll have 100 unmanned platforms that are providing maritime domain awareness in the Middle East by this July. But it's also taking a look at that data lake of information that we're collecting not only through unmanned platforms, but also that we get through all, the, all of our intelligence sources, uh, and then making sense of the environment, being more predictive of our patterns of life uh, with ships, with arms that are flowing, with terrorists that are flowing, with, uh, with, uh, with routes that uh, potential bad actors uh, might take advantage of. And so it allows us to put us in a position of advantage with, with respect to being more predictive and putting us in a place where we can make an intercept uh, in a much more impactful way than we have been able to do in the past, uh, rather than trying to you know, find a needle in a stack of needles, doing so in, in a much more informed kind of way. Um, so there are other ways that we are also taking a look at how we can, um, uh, how we can leverage new technologies. I think uh, microprocessing, uh, whether we're using applications uh, in our manpower uh, efforts or whether we're putting them in the hands of warfighters uh, to make decisions faster and to, and to be able to, to, to launch, uh, to take kinetic action quicker, um, we're seeing a lot of progress there. We're learning uh, from what the Ukrainians are doing. One of the things I found remarkable in Ukraine is the fact that they've taken uh, many of their citizens from industry people like you who are now on the front lines. They are bringing all of that innovative uh, drive to the battlefield and they are changing the way the Ukrainians are learning war as they're fighting war. And for the United States Navy, um, and I think for the other services as well, it's one of the most important lessons uh, that we can extol as we talk to our sailors and our junior officers about their biggest takeaways from that conflict and how they can make a difference uh, as critical thinkers. 
The last thing that I wanted to mention before we go to Q&A um, is the arsenal of democracy. And that is, um, that is a title that this country has earned. It is one of our hallmarks. It goes back to at one of FDR's fireside chats in the early night, probably around 19, December 1940, I think. Um, it is the benchmark for the world. As I met, have met with uh, over 40 heads of Navy in the past year, discussion about the U.S. defense industrial base is central to all of those discussions. What are we doing with them to be more interoperable? In some cases, AUKUS would be an example, to be more interchangeable. And I talk about industry, all you're, all you're doing for us, and they appreciate all you're doing for them. But just as the Navy has plenty of work to do under Get Real, Get Better uh, to improve ourselves, I talked about finding additional savings that we can repurpose to make ourselves more capable uh, and more lethal. Um, I admire some of the efforts that are ongoing in industry. As an example, and I'll just talk about the uh, submarine industrial base for a moment, Right now, they're producing at between 1.2 and 1.4 attack boats a year. They absolutely need to be a two or, or above two. And so part of what they're doing is strategic outsourcing, where they're sending a, a lot of their work, beginning to send more of their work to smaller uh, firms um, around the country. Um, and we think that that is going to end up giving us a significant lift, perhaps as much as 0.5 submarines a year here as we make those kinds of investments. As all of you are aware, uh, uh, U.S. government uh, uh, subsidizing uh, the shipbuilding industry went away during the Reagan administration. You're now beginning to see those subsidies come back, some nearly two and a half billion over the fitter for the submarine industry alone. Uh, a shipbuilder down on the Gulf Coast taking advantage of the Defense Production Act to shift their production lines from aluminum to steel. Some very innovative now. You know, a, a shift like that is not inconsequential for a company that size. Uh, and so I imagine the board, those are some uh, tense discussions as they made those decisions. But I think the United States government putting that money in uh, was really important and, and probably very much, at least from my view, very much appreciated. Um, that kind of lift for the industrial base is long overdue. But uh, what I'd ask for the industrial base, I go back to that that uh, moniker of arsenal of democracy, and I appeal to your patriotism, uh, that when you go back to the field, uh, to reiterate to your folks, those skilled laborers, just how important their work is, whether they're repairing ships and aircraft, or whether they're building them, how absolutely critical that work is in a critical decade. And I would ask all of you uh, to take a, uh, uh, a stronger look at how you can increase productivity. I know I listen to, I read some of your reports uh, quarterly. Uh, I know that um, a free flow of cash is important. I know paying down debts is important. Um, delivery of product is my number one ask of you, that that become your number one priority. And I know that you know, if you deliver quicker, you, you, know, you get that final payment when you, when you bring something over the line. But I would ask that that be, that be for, um, for the country, that that be uh, your top priority. OK, with that, let's take it to questions. And I'm happy to field anything that you have. Sir, we've got plenty of time. Oh, good. Well. Nobody's ever told me, hey, I wish you'd talk longer, so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We did, we did schedule an extra three hours just for you, sir. Yeah, I, I think that probably sets the table. I could go, you know, I, I figured we'd go deeper during Q&A to wherever the audience wants to go. Admiral? Yes. Yes, thank you, Admiral. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Abarish I'm a consultant of the Navy Company. I have a question on sign-off. Yeah. Right now, the GAO is estimating uh, that PASA will be going over budget and under schedule. What is the Department of the Navy's plans to ensure that it's out goes back on track and back on budget? Yeah, so I'll tell you, we're on track up at Portsmouth. So Portsmouth, Portsmouth New Hampshire, the shipyard there, is our first major uh, investment in terms of dry docks. A dry dock that's about 100 years old. So as you can imagine, uh, like a, uh, a version of a, uh, this old house, there were some things to learn. What we did with what we learned at Portsmouth is we took those lessons learned from industry and we applied them in Hawaii, which was a more 
complex, uh, which will be a more complex dry dock project. So, in, in the same manner by which uh, the Navy has the lead, but we're leveraging um, shipbuilders in the design of DDGX and SSNX, we're doing the same thing in the PSYOP project. We are bringing industry in to help us make much better informed decisions on how we're going to approach these, not once in a generation, once in a century investment projects. So we are applying lessons learned. We are already doing water, we're already in, in the water doing work uh, in Hawaii for Dry Dock 3, uh, and that should go into contract by the end of this month. So uh, it's not perfect. We are trying to be a learning organization and to uh, improve ourselves with every single project in PSYOP. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Admiral Kelly, uh, my name is Harry Kelso. I'm a lawyer in private practice and used to be a lawyer there at the Pentagon. And I was struck by one thing in terms of the, number, the comparison of the number of ships that the Navy had in the 80s when mm -hmm. we were fighting mm -hmm. one up against the mm -hmm. USSR. And now we have less, even fewer ships, and we've got a much larger adversary in mm -hmm. China. Is there any concern that uh, we don't have enough ships to take care of the security in the, in the seas? Every study that's been done since 2016, whether it's been inside the Pentagon, in industry, academia, has concluded that we need a larger Navy. Every single one of them. The law says 355. The latest studies that we've, uh, we've conducted have been 355 manned plus another 150 unmanned. And I'm in the middle of another assessment right now that, uh, that we will deliver to Congress in June, those are not perpetual in states. We are learning from war games, we're learning from exercises, we're learning from fleet battle problems, from analysis that's being done both inside the Pentagon and outside the Pentagon. So we are not satisfied with the trajectory that we're on. We think that it needs to be a steeper climb to 355, um, to answer your question directly. If you take a look at the alternatives in the shipbuilding plan, specifically in the, uh, in the last plan that was submitted in 2022, alternative three, Shows, um, shows a path to 355 that's informed by the capacity of industry, and it makes the assumption that in order to make 355 by, let's say, the mid to late 2030s, you need an injection of three or 5% uh, of uh, resources above our top line. So uh, we've got a ways to go. Yes. Good morning, Admiral. Thank you for your comments, especially on uh, uh, subsidies. Uh, yeah. Very interesting point. And then during the 80s, when Reagan disestablished the subsidies, uh, commercial shipbuilding in this country went away. Right. And the impact on the uh, industrial base and the uh, necessity for the SDN account to carry the whole uh, shipbuilding infrastructure in the country has just driven prices to the moon. So, are you seeing, uh, when you comment on that, you talk about subsidies, mm -hmm. are you seeing that as a sort of band aids and bits and pieces? Or are you seeing an appetite uh, at the higher levels in the Secretary to really uh, bring that capability back, uh, fund it to the level necessary to really get some commercial shipbuilding so we can help offset uh, the humps and values yep. of the uh, yep. Navy shipbuilding? That's a good point. So, uh, probably the best example would be the submarine industrial base. The submarines being our most lethal. Uh, stealthy platform that we have uh, with overmatch against any other adversary that we would face right now. We want to maintain that overmatch. So our cadence of production for submarines, as far as the eye can see, is two attack boats plus Columbia a year. Columbia is the priority. Uh, so Congress, well, Congress has not yet uh, passed uh, our, the budget that we just submitted, but in that budget is, uh, I think, 2.4 billion an investment in the submarine industrial base. That won't just go to the two big shipbuilders, uh, which are uh, HII Newport News and Electric Boat uh, up in Groton, but those other companies that I talked about that we're doing that strategic outsourcing with, they need to get some of that money. They need to make the investments in their infrastructure, in their workforce, so that we can sustain that 2.0 cadence, which by the way, needs to go above 2.0 attack boats a year if we're gonna be in a position to sell any to the Australians. So there's a lot of support, to directly answer your question, there's a lot of support and a recognition in the Pentagon that that's important. 
What we owe, what the Navy owes, is rigorous oversight in terms of how that funding is applied, and we need to see a return on investment for it. It can't just be uh, spending for spending's sake. So we are really, uh, we're, in fact, we're putting together an organization now that would include uh, a substantial uh, institutionalized um, organization to oversight, o oversee AUKUS. Um, and those in the submarine, in the submarine world, there are four big pillars that are tied together. There's, stuff, there's um, investments we're making in uh, an undersea domain awareness. You have your SSBN line, you have your SSN line, and then you have AUKUS. And so there are um, uh, dependencies across all of those lines and they need to be tied together. Anyway, I hope I answered your question, but there's other, there's other, there's other companies, uh, many represented in this room, that have also been getting uh, injections of CapEx from, uh, from the DOD through Navy accounts. Hi, this is Brandy Vincent. I'm a reporter with the Scoop. Thank you. Oh, he's over there. Over here. Oh, oh sorry, ma'am. Thank you so much, Admiral, for doing this. I'm Brandy Vincent, a reporter with the Scoop. You sure. spoke a little bit about plans to really scale the project over going forward, yeah. but can you dig a little deeper for us about plans for fiscal year 2024 with Project Overmatch? What are you expecting, and what would you really like to see accomplished? Yeah, I want to see a successful instantiation in the Vincent Strike Group as they deploy. So we are, when we're doing experimentation now, and you see the same thing in Fifth Fleet with Unmanned, it's not experimentation for experimentation's sake. I am trying, we are trying to experiment and deliver um, capability within the fit-up against real-world problems. So Overmatch gives us the ability, right, to... Uh, to sense, to make sense of, to make decisions, and then to act quicker than the adversary um, in a way that is uh, resilient um, uh, and adaptable. And so what I'm expecting big things out of Vincent Strike Group this year, uh, that, that we can make a decision on where we put, you know, what elements uh, do we accelerate, what elements do we sundown and pivot from, what have we learned. Uh, and so I'm learning, I, I, I want to use Vincent to accelerate the scaling. Sir. Good morning, JC. With Good morning, sir. Um, how uh, how's the morale, particularly with going, you know, forty percent unmanned? You know, how do you see one morale and two quick time to recruiting and workforce GE in the future to run all those unmanned uh, vessels going from sixty forty split, particularly with our airways? Thanks, Admiral. Uh, a lot of excitement. Um, a lot of excitement. In fact, we are uh, opening up a new robotics rating. Um, you see elements of the Navy that do a lot of work with AI and robotics. Um, uh, explosive ordnance demolition uh, would be an example. And so we are leveraging what we've learned in communities like that uh, to take to the aviation community as we work manned unmanned teaming with the MQ-25 and the, current, uh, in the, in the current air wing. The same thing with the undersea is uh, one of the vendors here in the crowd delivers our XLUUV this year, four more next year. Uh, and we deploy those forward. So we are, I will say, our approach with unmanned is very deliberate. So we have plenty of lessons learned in the past where we've moved too quickly and we've made mistakes. I'm trying to make sure, particularly as we do this experimentation with unmanned and AI and manned unmanned teaming in the Middle East, we're learning a ton. But the next place I scale at is not going to be to the South China Sea. We have more work to do in terms of learning how we bring those technologies together with, with, with people that are in uh, 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 standardized rates, ratings today in the Navy, skill sets in the Navy today. So I think we're going to, again, learn a lot as we move forward and uh, gradually make changes in our manpower system. I think recruiting people, um, they already see, we already see the value of unmanned that it's having in our recruiting efforts. Sir. Oh, I'm on. There we go. Yep. So, about Bill Conley, Chief Technology Officer at Mercury Systems. I, I love the Arsenal Democracy. Um, mm. Arthur Herman uh, wrote Freedom's Forge, phenomenal book looking at that. During kind of the World War II, Cold War era, the government out invested in R&D industry. Mm -hmm. Today, there's three dollars coming from industry for every dollar on the federal side. At least. If we think about that Arsenal of Democracy mm -hmm. in the modern world, what do we need in particular, not for the platforms, but for the payloads? to bring that innovation that you want access to to make sure we keep that vision alive. Yeah, so as, as I take a look at Unmanned, 
payloads is not a problem. There are plenty of companies that build payloads and we are taking those payloads. The real magic with Unmanned is the integration with AI. The software integration is what really brings those platforms alive. The, the, what, what I like about leveraging commercial technology in the area of Unmanned is that most of that technical risk is already driven down. That's where we've had most of the problems, most of the challenges in our major procurement, uh, our major acquisition lines have been driving down risk and not driving it down early enough. And these commercial applications, particularly with unmanned platforms, most of, this, most of these platforms are already being used in the commercial industry in some, in some fashion. And so we're just, we're just taking that truck and we're giving it, you know, we're, we're taking that Tesla-like vehicle, and, and we are taking AI that's shaped to, to, give it, uh, to bring it alive to get after the problems that we need solved. The other thing is we've learned is um, um, we've seen benefit in having uh, the, the coders for the, for the AI capability and the platform be separate uh, and distinct vendors. We've seen, we, we think there's a level of competition there uh, that we've kind of liked. Uh, we've seen small companies come in really hungry and committed. And so we are learning a lot in the AI space in terms of what's going on in Task Force 59. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Sir, ma'am. Hi, this will be with the AA Systems, and I also do a lot of work with uh, National Defense Industrial Association. Um, and first off, I didn't think I was going to be commenting on commerciality, but thank you. I love you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, you know, as I'm sure you know, DB is associated with um, the origins of the Cost Accounting Standards Board, um, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if that's the direction where you was headed when you mentioned cost control, or do you have something else in mind? It sounded like you were thinking something very specific. I, so, um, I think that we have a lot of money in our procurement accounts that I can't necessarily see as CNO because they are behind technical authorities or acquisition authorities that are grounded in the law that fall underneath the Secretary of the Navy. I, and I, I'm not laying blame, blame anywhere except to say um, procurement accounts are 31% of our budget. And there's a lot of dough there. You all know that. That's why you're here. Uh, and so there are ways to look for more efficiencies and then to shift those savings somewhere else. I'm interested in doing more of that. I'm interested in taking a deeper look at where and how we spend our money and where we might be able to make smarter choices. I, as I said, you know, this 37% increase is 55 billion, ain't gonna last. I just met with all the flag officers in the Navy last week. That was, that was part of my pitch. You know, wipe those smiles off your faces. We got some work to do. Thanks. If I can, close with one last question. Sure. In this case, and, and this may be too long a question, it's too hard to answer in the time we have, but in my last tour in the Pentagon, I watched platforms continue to go way beyond their expected end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at the first Columbia company in the Ohio that replaces the Columbia serving active submarine, do we have to start thinking about either replenishing more quickly or changing the way we architect our army platforms? Is that a challenge in industry? So one of the things we have to get real about, uh, instead of talking about estimated service lives, talking about actual service lives. So um, we've got a ship in a shipyard right now down in Norfolk. It's an old amphibious ship. It's 34, 35 years old. As I take a look at what eats up our accounts, right? I take a look in a, in a repair yard. I take a look at new work and growth work. On average, our new work is at about 5% uh, and our growth work is at about 16% across ships in the Navy and shipyards. With that particular old amphibious ship, new work's at 68%. So she is uh, four years behind out of the shipyard. She's costing us millions more than we need. We have to make tough decisions here. That's money that we could pivot somewhere else. Then we need to be more innovative with ships that we have in the inventory and how we can use them differently. Um, the, Navy's, um, the Navy's requirement for expeditionary fast transports that were built down on the Gulf Coast was 10 of those ships. Congress has blessed us with 16 of those ships. So I am looking for ways that we might be able to use those more innovatively. As the, as the, uh, uh, the Marine, uh, a leader in the Marine Corps said in December, it's not always about numbers. Ships need to be workable and they need to be usable. So those ships that aren't either 
usable or workable, uh, I might be able to replace those with something that's a little bit more agile. Uh, we may have to act a little, may have to use them a little bit differently. I get back to driving adaptability, affecting change. That's how we need to think as well in the Navy and can't be so wedded to the way we've always done things. Looking pretty serious there, Jim. Do, do, can I throw out the very last one? I have got, got one minute to go. your conference. You mentioned the 3 to 5%. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think you touched on two things. Number one is could, could you provide a little more insight into you know, the eight ships, why those can no longer see the fire, why they have a problem, number one. Yeah. And then number two, um, there was obviously a shortfall in resourcing uh, in terms of um, the sea services together. Uh, yeah, I'll take the last one first. You asked me about amphibious ships. Is that the code uh, that you're asking me about? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so it's been said publicly that uh, a year ago, the officer of the Secretary of Defense made a decision to take a pause and to do a study on LPDs and whether or not we would continue with the current hull or whether or not we would shift to some. Uh, variant of the current hull. The driving issue there that, that, that drove that decision had to do with cost. So the cost of that ship has gone from 1.47 billion to the second ship at 1.5. The third one that we're contracting for right now is probably going to be between 1.9 and 2 billion. So that increase will be somewhere between 21 and 25 percent. The FY35 ship, unless we did a bundle buy, would likely be a $2 billion or above, 20, at least a 25% increase. We're moving in the wrong direction. So it's an FY25 ship. Marine Corps leader said recently that he is supportive of two-year centers for those ships. In other words, you would begin building one every two years. We're just, I just mentioned, we haven't put the 23 ship on contract yet. The line is already running behind. So as a taxpayer, if you want to give the vendor money next year for a ship that they can't bend metal on, OK? So I think that we have time here to, to, take, to take a look. It goes back to the fact that we're not going to be swimming in money forever. And we've got to start making some hard decisions. So a ship in the 25 line, right? This is the FY25 budget. It's akin to, let me just say this. Congress has given us the authorities in the latest NDAA to do a bundle buy. And we all agree that that's the way that we ought to go after those ships. But to go after a single ship in 25 and put that in the budget now, based on where we are with all this churn on cost and so forth, and this concern about the cost of those ships, it's like telling a car dealer, hey, I really want to buy that minivan. Let's, I'm going to buy that minivan. Now let's roll up our sleeves and talk about price. You know, It's just not going to... It's not going to drive down the price of that ship. It needs to be competitive. So actually, with that production line and that ship, it's not competitive. One, one company builds it. Um, OK, uh, anything, else on, uh, anything else on the LPD line? I'm sure that'll open up some. Uh... Going once, going twice. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, my god. Thank, thank you. Uh, on that, um, on that, um, the question for the divestment of transit, the early question. Um, I'm just interested, what would be the cost to get the ships that you're the three the three um, LSD ships that you want to divest to get them to a state where you would keep them? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it's almost like a rolling average. Every year there's a new check that, you know, we got to write on a ship, you know, one of them that should have been out of the yards in 2019 that was still, you know, been forced to keep and is still writing checks on. Um, I'll have to just, I'll have to uh, take that one for the record, if you will, and come back to you, come back to you with the amount. I don't know it off the top of my head for those three ships, um, but we'll get you that information. It, it's, uh, it's, it's substantial. You know, the, the, when we take a look at the investments, I'll just say real quick, Jim, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk. Uh, um, the, the entering argument for us is uh, our top line. And so I said earlier, we're only going to have a Navy as big as we can afford. 
And so then what we do is we stratify all of our platforms in terms of lethality. And that's also informed by um, sustainability, what it's going to cost us to keep those ships, as well as reliability. For cruisers, as an example, I'm pulling them into Suda Bay Crete or I'm pulling them into Djibouti during deployment to fix holes in the ship below the water line. I got water going into birthing compartments. So those are considerations as well. But lethality is the driver for us, right, given where we are with, with, the, pacing, with the pacing challenge. Stratify those platforms and then making decisions that those are the least, least lethal are going to be are going to be in the are going to be on the uh, on the table um, to propose to Congress that we decommission. The, the friction with Congress is capacity in the repair yards, and I get that. But you know, just having visited a repair yard with with a cruiser that's undergoing moder moder uh, um, uh, modernization, as well as an older amphib, they are not making money on those ships. So. And they are not lethal. We're not going to get them underway for the fight. So my proposal is, like, let's, let's reinvest in something that is going to be lethal and it is going to put us in a position of advantage against, against, uh, against the pacing threat. That's not always met well, but you know, I have other ships waiting to go into maintenance. We are, uh, our operations and maintenance, maintenance account is increasing next year to buy even more availabilities uh, for our ships. Why? Because readiness is the number one priority. I hope that answered your question, Jim. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. <laughs>